all day and not as many as Brian. He's going to have to keep talking for a longer time. But I'm very pleased to introduce, uh, I don't want to screw your computer up, uh, introduce Brian Enquist. He, uh, we were just talking about Rob Peters before the seminar started because his own PhD work at the University of New Mexico back in the 90s was influenced by Rob on the allometry side, not on the other side. So we had a good uh, reminiscence about my interactions with Rob and his role in the department. I wish, and maybe Rob is here in spirit, there's a lot that uh, Brian can talk to him about, talk to us about, but today he's not going to talk about allometry. He's going to talk about work he's been doing with big data sets, looking at patterns of biodiversity. He's published on many, many topics. Uh, during the wine and cheese, you're welcome to talk to him about anything and everything. But uh, at least now, please welcome uh, Brian, and it's all yours. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? This room? What, what a fantastic room. I think this probably is one of the better rooms I've ever given a talk in. Thank you very much, Martin, for uh, the invitation, but also your encouragement uh, over, over the years. Um, so, yes, and thank you also for uh, the time um, already to have met with several folks in um, various different discussions. Um, so, for my talk, um, permission to, to tweet, you can tweet away. Um, here's where you can reach me up there, at least on my Twitter handle. handle. So what I would like to talk to you about today is actually mostly all new work. Um, there's a chunk of it that actually hasn't seen the light of day yet, so, so take it with a grain of salt. Okay, it could be horribly wrong, but I'm interested in any sort of feedback or your candid thoughts on the matter, but I figured that we were so excited about a lot of these different results, we wanted to get some test runs. Um, but what I really wanted to focus on is mainly the output of an NC's working group. It actually turns out to be the longest a uh, working group um, in NC's history. And in a way, I'm kind of ashamed saying that because of, geez, you know, we're just now starting to get stuff out. But it really did point to the fact that when the, the, the problems that we were dealing with actually turned out to be really difficult and time consuming. And hence the title of my talk, in particular, The Entangled Bank. And so to kind of use Darwin's Entangled Bank, it's really kind of a metaphor for not only our kind of incipient desire to kind of describe the biodiversity that, that's around us, but also the need to understand not only how that diversity arose, but also what maintains it. But the other really kind of insidious kind of uh, part of the title is that I think it's a very uh, appropriate title for just how horrible our biological data are in terms of its complexities, the entanglement, and trying to figure out what good data is from bad. So what I would like to do is address this question. Um, what controls the origin and maintenance of diversity, uh, gradients and diversity? Now, don't be disappointed. I don't think I'm really going to answer this, okay? but this is the question that I'm going to really wrestle with. And I think what we're, we've been kind of discovering, or uncovering anyways, is, um, is quite interesting and novel. So what I'm showing you here is the location of, um, at the time, used to be one of the, the largest standardized um, uh, botanical data sets, these are ecological plots. Uh, these are 227 gentry plots or gentrosos. These are uh, 10 hectare forest plots uh, originally pioneered here by um, the, the late Alan Gentry uh, from the Missouri Botanical Garden. And what Gentry did was going around the world and put in these standardized plots where he not only measured how many um, uh, plant species there were within each plot, but then he did this at several different locations okay, across the globe. And so they really provide us with a standardized sample then of changes in diversity across global gradients. So a standardized methodology as well. And so what you see here is effectively the latitudinal gradient, peak in diversity is centered dead right on the tropics. But notice also that right on then the equator, there's enormous variability in alpha diversity then within each of these sites. So what I would like to do is ask, can we kind of step back and take in the botanical information that we have access to currently, and for any given place in the New World, North or South America, how many species of plants are there? Not just trees, but, you know, bryophytes and ferns and, and everything. Can we actually do that? How many species are there in the Americas, for one? What hypotheses best explain the distribution of plant diversity? Now, to kind of take the Darwin kind of uh, a reference and then counter that with Wallace. And so Wallace had this great quote in terms of if you want to 
answer any of these basic questions in terms of the distribution of diversity, none of these questions are going to be satisfactorily answered until you have the geographic ranges of numerous species to basically go back and answer these questions. Now, unlike mammals, birds, some species of insects, fish, for plants, we still don't have the ability to accurately describe the geographic distributions, then, of all plants, or patterns of botanical diversity in different parts of the planet. Our, our knowledge now is basically still based on statistical correlations with climate, okay, not based on the raw observation data. So the approach that I'm going to be taking here is a pure eco-informatics one, right, having to do with assembling all botanical data that we can find from North and South America. Now, the, there's been amazing growth in biodiversity data just over the last decade, right? So I'm showing you here the increase in biodiversity data. This is from the Global Biodiversity uh, Information Facility, or GBIF, just in terms of the total number of data providers or the total number of rec records, observation records shared, okay? As you can see, we're in the millions of records, right? And this will keep increasing and increasing. And so, my initial reaction to all this is that this is fantastic. This is really good for our science, right? Right? <laughs> right? So the problem is that when you download this information and try to do something with it, you start to discover issues. And so this is what this working group has been mainly focused on, in that there's actually a very dark underbelly to bioinformatics, in particular ecoinformatics. So if we're going to use these big data, uh, data to quantify patterns of species diversity, we should know that the data available right now are seriously error prone. I don't have a lot of time to go into the details, but there's problems of taxonomy. We're really limited by our ability to place accurate names then on species. Okay? A lot of the data are bad because um, we don't have you know, really accurate measures of geographic coordinates. Units tend to be scrambled or wrong presence of non-native taxa basically infiltrate and poison a lot of these different data sets. There's issues of sampling. Okay? Sampling is definitely non-random. There are holes geographically where we sample. And so initially when we started accessing a lot of this information and trying to compare the diversity of two different sites, we started to seriously wonder and question about our ability to accurately characterize even alpha diversity across large gradients. So the ability to do not only repeatable theories, uh, science, but also to test our various different biodiversity uh, theories, uh, we actually started to question. So what I would like to do for this talk is give you a quick overview of kind of the goals of this BN uh, working group. But I also would like to give you a quick overview of what we feel is uh, the limitations <coughs> of focusing so much on a species richness approach. The new work that I would like to show are these new directions where we're trying to approach problems of uh, variation in species diversity, but using different ways. In particular, we would like to try to use a trait-based approach, phylogenetic approach, but also focus on differences in terms of the distribution of commonness and rarity. So our working group, the BN Working Group, short for Botanical Information and Eco-Informatics Network, uh, we first started in 2008 and kept getting extensions. We extended it to 2012. We got picked up as an iPlant working group. iPlant is a cyber infrastructure um, synthesis center based at the University of Arizona. Um, over the years, there's been over 50 people involved uh, within the working group, but all focused on the same kind of central component associated with integrating botanical data. If you're interested in more, we have a website that you can check out. Um, but that's not really so much what I'm here to talk about. What I'm here to talk about is what we can do with integrating botanical data. And so these are our goals. We had informatics goals and we had deliverable products goals. We wanted to create tools for integration, scrubbing, standardization of botanical data. We wanted to create an integrated database by which anybody could query different aspects of botanical information. And we, more importantly, we wanted to create a repeatable workflow where anybody could then utilize these different tools in order then to take data from data providers, integrate them, scrub them, standardize them, and make them then available. Our derived products, we now effectively finished up most of these. We wanted to create a standardized species list for all plants, all embryophytes uh, for the new world. We wanted to create a standardized trait database then for all the plants in the new world. 
create a species level phylogeny then for all plants in the new world, but then create for every plant species in the new world geographic range maps. To give you the 50,000 foot kind of overview, our goal is to take specimen data, ecological plots, and trait data, integrate these data using taxonomic intelligence, data scrubbing and correcting in a common exchange schema to then make this available in order to do science. To give you an overview of the types of data, again, we're taking observation records coming from herbaria, coming from various museum records, coming from ecological plots. So these are surveys where people go out and count how many different individuals, identify them, trait measurements. Here are our two different iterations of the BM data uh, base itself. So these are post-scrubbing. These are basically the trustworthy data, okay, and actually filtering out a lot of the, the messy data. This is the total number of observations, total number of specimens, total number of plot observations, total number of plots, total number of species. Our first pass in 2012, we've now kind of reiterated and tried to grow the, uh, the database. This is in 2014. Currently now, uh, VN3 has about 83 million uh, observation records uh, within it. Globally, that accounts for about 374,000 um, embryophyte species. This is the proportional increase in terms of going from 2012 to 2014 in terms of the total amount of data. And it, every year, there's even more and more data available. So the total amount of increase um, in in potentially uh, uh, accessible data is truly astronomical. We estimate that if one really tried, one could obtain on the order of 500 million observations to up to 1 billion uh, botanical observation records um, within probably a year or two. So to give you kind of a flavor of the various different data scrubbing and, and standardization uh, uh, steps, this is non-trivial. There are a lot of issues associated with scrubbing and standardization. The one real tricky issue that we've had has to do with taxonomic standardization. Misspelling of Latin names, synonymies, are all kind of nightmare scenarios in terms of trying to standardize data. And one kind of interesting fact, we found that on the order, take any sort of botanical uh, data set, and on the order of between 30, 40, even up to 50% of the names alone are wrong, on some level being misspelled, all right, being older names, okay, some sort of you know, taxonomic issue associated with the names, there's a lot of, uh, of errors. And so in going through and including not only uh, standardization steps, we're then able to come up with a clean set of data okay, by which we can then start to calculate geographic range maps then for all species in the new world. Now we quickly maxed out the computers at uh, the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. <coughs> We quickly went to the Texas Advanced Computing Center and we used, um, I love the name, Ranger is the name of the supercomputer. It's Texas, right? <laughs> and we were able then to scale up our various range modeling algorithms. Um, and so we took our original estimate on the order of about eight months to a year using the NC's com uh, computational uh, services. TAC was able to do it on the order of about two days. Um, so currently, and if you're interested, um, we produce many different flavors of range modeling. And I have to say, one can have an endless discussion uh, as in terms of how best to do this. We're getting ready to do another pass um, using many more different um, uh, flavors of, of range modeling. I don't want to get into kind of those details. Happy to talk about them later. But for our first pass, I'm going to talk about uh, today, um, we're dealing with about 88,000 uh, geographic range maps then that we generated to give you a sense Here's what kind of the data come in. Looking, these are scrubbed good data. One species is the first row species within Mexico. Um, we can then, based on, again, different flavors of species um, niche modeling, come up with um, an estimate then of a range. We can do this for basically every species then within the end database. And then we can create something like this which is an overlap then of approximately 90,000 range maps. Okay? And so this is at least our first pass in terms of looking at the distribution of species diversity across the new world. 
And so what was really interesting, and we tried to approach this using rarefaction methods and many other methods associated with differences in, in, in sampling, and our overall patterns were all coming out to be about the same. And so what you actually see is this striking clustering then of diversity associated then not only within uh, the wet kind of foothills here of the Andes, but then also moving into the Cordillera of uh, Central America. The other striking thing is that although the Amazon basin okay, is diverse, okay, so even in the white to kind of yellowish here is diverse, it's not as diverse okay, as other areas then throughout South America, but also then into Central America. Remember, this is all plant species. So we're talking about bryophytes and mosses, as well as trees and so on. So this is our first look then at patterns then of diversity across the new world. And so what immediately pops out is that there's tremendous heterogeneity in terms of uh, locations then of uh, hotspots and diversity. Again, one now we're trying quickly trying to make. You know, these information uh, uh, available as much as possible. So if you're interested in the data, they're, they're available. But unfortunately, because of the size of it, you have to kind of like write us. And so we'll, we'll try to, try to, try to uh, uh, get you going. Okay, so the geographic range maps as well as the phylogeny and traits are available for use. So um, I'd like to switch gears now. Now that we have this kind of like baseline data that we can start to kind of play with, um, I want to kind of step back and um, kind of tell you a little bit about kind of how my thoughts have kind of changed. I know several folks here are also thinking very much the same way. But in general, my, my kind of operational thesis is that progress in biodiversity science, and when I mean progress, I mean our ability to predict why we should see variation in species richness, but also variation in ecosystem functioning, I think in general has been quite a bit limited by the primary focus on species richness. That is, in species richness, the total number of species per unit area. Right? So when you get down to it, species richness is an important number, but it's just a number. And what we found is that it's very difficult to link a number, number of species per unit area, to the, our underlying processes and theory, uh, then, for explaining variation in species diversity. And so the working uh, kind of hypothesis, again, is that patterns based on species richness do not offer a strong basis to develop and test theory. And instead, to a better identify pattern and to link measures of the diversity of life with theory, we need to incorporate additional information besides just species richness. One paper in particular that I've been kind of influenced by, because I also know these folks, is Christoph Roy, David Jablonski, and James Valentine. They're paleontologists. This is a very nice chapter um, in the book. Uh, approaches, uh, I'm sorry, uh, frontiers in biogeography, new approaches to the geography and nature. And what they argue in this chapter is that we need to increasingly move to alternative measures of diversity. And they have this great quote here in saying that a true understanding of the processes underlying diversity and patterns requires a better understanding of other aspects of organismal biology and geographic variations as characters. And in particular, they state that focusing on differences in morphology, functional biology, phylogenetic affinities of species is truly reflective then of the diversity of life. Okay. And species richness per se, not so much. Okay, so getting into the actual science, so what I would like to do is focus again on three different approaches that we've been taking to then take the BN data associated with patterns of diversity and then to try to kind of disentangle what may be the underlying processes and kind of operating. So the first thing that we'd like to do is focus uh, focus a little bit more on functional diversity, right? So looking out here in the lowland uh, uh, rainforest here in Costa Rica, what we want to do is take then a specific location for each then of the different species then that occur here, assign then trait values, okay? So that as we then go from the alpha scale to the beta scale, compare differences in diversity across space, or compare differences in entire landscapes, say something about how functional diversity changes. And so for the approach that I would like to kind of point out, and for many of you, um, we've already talked about this a little bit today, is I'd like to focus on another, one measure of functional diversity, that is the trait hypervolume. Okay. And so for this one study, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on a set of traits, and each of these traits then of, um, uh, from plants have, are, are tightly associated with differences in ecological strategies and um, life histories associated then with plants. 
So in particular, changes in wood density, seed mass, and the specific leaf area. The specific leaf area is the area of the leaf divided by the mass of the leaf. And it tightly couples to differences in uh, allocation in terms of how long then a leaf lasts, whether or not a leaf lives a very short uh, period of time, photosynthesis, uh, photosynthesizes a, a great amount, respires a great amount, but, but uh, lives a, a short time, or if the specific leaf area is, is high, meaning then that uh, in general, uh, leaves tend to live a very long time, photosynthesize, uh, and respire at the lower rate. So each of these different traits then, in addition to uh, maximum height, effectively then characterize differences in the variation in plant life histories. Okay? So what we would like to do then is for each species, um, go through and measure each of these different traits, okay, and put it within this hypervolume context. And so if we sample then a given assemblage, we can then characterize then the, the volume of this functional space. Right? So what we can do is we can go back then to the literature and recast some biodiversity theories in terms of functional space, but also the packing of species then within that space, but then also the entire functional volume then associated with that space. So we can take kind of the, the classic biotic pressure hypothesis that then builds on many, uh, many different kind of prominent authors. And the idea here is that within warm and wet environments, Natural selection has then led to an increased range of phenotypes for traits. So in warm, wet environments, you'd expect then to be, selection then to be effectively relaxed, and so you could effectively explore all of this variation in life history trade-offs. Kind of alternatively, the stress dominance or the uh, filtering hypothesis effectively states that as you go then from a uh, non-stressful to a stressful then environment, Within or across clades, stressful environments is going to lead to stronger stabilizing selection or, or stronger filtering than of traits, which will then limit ecological and evolutionary variation in functions and strategies. Right? So as you go from high diverse areas, you'd expect to see a greater functional volume. As you go to low diverse areas, you expect to see a smaller functional volume. So we can look at alpha diversity or alpha trait values. So as we move along our diversity gradient, going from low diversity to high diversity, we calculate our trait hypervolume. We have an expectation based on sampling alone. Okay? So if I only have a, one community with one species, obviously it's going to have a small functional volume. But as I add more and more species, the functional volume will actually just grow just by chance, because I'm sampling more and more and more species. So we have a sampling expectation that there should be a positive relationship, and I'll tell you that there is. You just randomly sample traits, this is what you'll get. But what we're interested in is deviation from the sampling expectation. So we expect that low diversity, because of filtering or the stressful environments, we expect the hypervolume to be lower than expected. If there's increased biotic pressure, especially in the tropics, we expect then the hypervolume, the functional space, to be greater than we would expect by random sampling. So that's one way of measuring alpha diversity. What about beta diversity? Well, if we look at the change then in the functional space from one point to maybe another point here, and we calculate then the change then in the volume or the decay rate of the volume as we move across environmental gradients, we actually expect as you increase the geographic distance, in the tropics, we'd expect to see more functional overlap between communities because the tropics are so similar to find that. Whereas within the temperate zone, we expect there to be more of a steeper decline um, in terms of the functional overlap between sites. Similarly, we can extend out to the gamma scale. So at the continental scale, we'd expect because of environmental filtering, increased environmental stress, okay, well again, will restrict the subset of traits available. So then, as we increase in latitude, go from the tropics to the temperate zone, the total trait hypervolume at each of these latitudinal bands should then decrease. So this paper just came out as part of a special issue on functional biogeography. There's a lot of really good papers associated with this special issue, and this was our contribution. Um, Christine, Ben, and Cyril. Um, uh, Christine uh, and Ben were a PhD, they were PhD students in my lab, and Cyril is a postdoc in my lab. Um, but then we collaborated then with the VN group in order to do these analyses. 
And so um, both uh, Cyril now has a permanent job at CNRS and locally in France, but Christine and Ben are now postdocing, looking for jobs you know, right now. So here's effectively what we did. We wanted to quantify trade hypervolumes, okay? but instead of relying on just the, the original 200 or so gentry plots, we've now been able to assemble um, about 620 uh, gentrosos then across the New World. We then have traits for about 5,000 then of those species then that were sampled within uh, each of the communities, seed size, maximum height, specific leaf area, wood density, and so on. So what we did is we compared the relative functional diversity um, with a series of different null models. Okay, if you're interested, we can talk more about that. But in general, we try to standardize based on the observed net level of richness or hypervolumes greater than or less than what we expect. And if you're interested in this, this builds on um, a methods paper that we also just published in Global Ecology and Biogeography, having to do with measuring n-dimensional hypervolumes. And so this um, method can be applied to many different uh, questions within biology. This is now an R package called Hypervolume that you can download and you can use. It allows you to not only calculate um, the hypervolume, but also overlap uh, density then uh, within hypervolumes and so on. So what are our results? So if we look at the alpha uh, functional diversity, or the alpha hypervolume, as we increase at an absolute latitude, what we find is that the alpha hypervolume actually decreases. Okay? So that by the time we get to um, uh, uh, high latitudes, we see then a decrease then in the hypervolume. But again, as I said, we expect this relationship just based on chance. Okay? Because you get smaller and smaller numbers of species, the hypervolume should actually decrease just based on chance. And so the question is, is this greater than or less than we'd expect by chance? So when we actually plot the tree community diversity versus the alpha hypervolume, <coughs> If I then show you this uh, gray band here, okay, this is the random then expectation based on sampling. Okay? And so what we actually find is that at low diverse sites, we don't see significant differences then between alpha diversity and the hypervolume. The only differences where we do see any sort of reduction is actually in the hyperdiverse tropical plots. And the reduction, effectively saying that within tropical plots, we find more filtering. Opposite to our expectation then for the alpha functional diversity then in temperate plots. And so this is actually interesting because in general, we don't find very strong evidence based on the species level of diversity of any sort of reduction then in functional space at the alpha level. At the beta level, if we calculate then the overlap of hypervolumes as we then compare then uh, communities then across uh, from each other increasing distance. So as we increase then the distance, we calculate the beta hypervolume overlap. Indeed, the ge as geographic uh, distance increases, the decay is steepest within the temperate biome itself. Okay? So the degree then of decay, again, from the tropics uh, in the temperate zone is then steeper than what we see within the tropics. But when we look then at the gamma hypervolume, so if we go through each of these different latitudinal bands, Again, so here we have, you know, uh, within the tropics, so this is uh, the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere. And if we actually look at the absolute latitude, the gamma hypervolume, what we actually find, if anything, there's no real difference to maybe a possible peak at around the transition between the tropics and the temperate zone. Right? So we don't see a major reduction in the gamma functional diversity space within the temperate zone. And to kind of prove it to you, this is a kind of a 3D animation then of these hypervolumes looking at specific leaf area, um, maximum height, and seed mass. Uh, couldn't do four dimensions, it's hard to look at, you know, but here we're looking at, at three dimensions. So it, it's a little bewildering, uh, be, be, bewildering in terms of the colors, but what I'm going to uh, kind of like tell you here is that this um, gold region or this yellowish region, that is the area of overlap in the trait combinations between the temperate zone and the tropics. And by far, most of that volume is an overlap in functional trait space. In fact, we have a very hard time differentiating tropical forests from temperate forests in terms of their trait volumes. They overlap tremendously. The temperate hypervolume, if I just include all the temperate zone, which is actually in the blue here, 
the temperate hypervolume actually is greater than the tropical hypervolume. There's actually more functional diversity within the temperate zone than in the tropics. Now, there are some unique spaces and combinations here in both the tropics and the temperate zone in terms of unique trait combinations, okay, which is probably telling of something. But in general, what we see is amazing overlap in terms of functional space, but also the temperate zone hypervolume is larger. We can also see that in terms of the overlap between uh, latitudinal bands. So red then being high overlap between bands, blue then being very low overlap. Within the tropics, we see a lot of overlap then between, uh, uh, between latitudinal bands, but within the temperate zone, even comparing in the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere, they don't overlap too much. Okay, there's pretty low overlap. And if we were then to take our different predictions for this biotic pressure hypothesis, abiotic filtering, or even neutral theory, I don't have a lot of time to talk about our connections and with hypervolumes and neutral theories, but I'm happy to do that. If we look at our predictions for alpha scale, beta scale, and gamma scale, and if we then plot our observed then values, what we actually find is that there's no real strong correspondence with any of our patterns to what these uh, different theories then would predict for differences in hypervolumes. We do appear to see some matching with abiotic filtering, but I'll note that the observed, uh, the prediction of increased abiotic filtering in the temperate zone is actually not correct because most of our filtering signal that we see is actually for the tropical sites themselves. So in general, the results are not uniformly consistent by, with any theory, and that may very well be that maybe all of these processes are happening at the same time. So then to summarize this part, patterns of functional trait diversity at different geographic scales were not entirely consistent with any one of these different theories for variation in species richness. In general, we actually find evidence for more filtering okay, within, the, within the tropics. We do see evidence for increased beta uh, diversity filtering within the temperate zone. But it's not necessarily consistent um, in terms of the gamma.